Good morning and welcome to another episode of Book Club with Caden Kelly. This is a podcast where I seek to improve my health, my wealth, my wisdom, and my peace. And I do that by reading a different nonfiction book every week and talk about it on a podcast that you know goes along with one of those four uh, areas of improvement. And I do this to help keep myself accountable to read the book each week. And then sharing it helps me process the information better and also allows you to get some of the juicy details to help improve those areas of your life as well. Um, this is, uh, I, do it, I do this podcast live on Mondays. I, the time is very. The time varies. It used to be early in the morning, and now it varies from any time from now to the evening time. But ge- generally, it's in the late mornings, around ten or eleven a.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time on Facebook and on Twitch and on YouTube, and you could find links to all of that to to join the live podcast, to share your thoughts, and. Uh, to comment questions or input or whatever uh, through the link on my blog, cadenkellysblog.wordpress.com, where I also I write. You know, I you'll find you'll find my blog where I write crap. I try to write about the stuff that I learned too. See, all of this is supposed to help me understand the information better. It's one thing to read it, but I go through several steps of of. Uh, understanding the the content i read the book i take notes on the book i talk about it in a podcast and then i write about it in a blog that way i you know it just kind of gets ingrained in my brain uh what good is all of this information if i'm not learning it and then i generally try to uh i try to come up with something practical to do at the end of the episode but uh that you know whatever so Check out all of the links to all of the crap. You'll, you can find the links to the live through the blog. Uh, you can find my Instagram on there where I, I, I used to share TikToks and little, you know, little short video clips, but I'm putting my attention into the blog and the podcast now. And I also do a 15-minute version of this podcast so that if the, you know, this usually goes 60 or 90 minutes, and if that's too long for you, then you could go, we could do it in, 15 minutes on Here's the Point with Caden Kelly, which is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and it's posted on Instagram. So, all of that being said, welcome to the chat, Mashed Pajados. He's been uh, he's been along for the journey from day one, and his comments are hit and miss, but most of the time, really good insight. So if you want to join him in the chat, you can uh, you can join us live on Mondays. Oh well, this uh, this last week we had a we had a good week last week, except it kind of ended on a sour note because my fridge broke, my refrigerator broke, and now I have I lost all of my frozen goodies and most of my refrigerator goodies, and I'm living out of a cooler. And I tried all of the troubleshooting shit i could find on youtube to fix a refrigerator and a freezer and nothing's working so if any of you know how to fix a refrigerator well by the time you hear this i'll probably have a new refrigerator but uh if you if there's like a trick to saving my refrigerator then tell me because all i did i took the that little the panel off on the back of the fridge i cleaned off the coils and I unplugged it for 24 hours because someone on the internet said that they these condenser like the the is it the condenser or a compressor or whatever it is can freeze, and so you want to let it thaw, and that's probably why the fridge is not getting cold because it's on but it's not cold. So I, I turned it off for 24 hours and I plugged it back in for 24 hours, and it's still not cold. But the like the readings on the the temperature say that it's cold so whatever sucks sucks but it is what it is right so i was dealing with that we played we played a hell of a game of pickleball on saturday um we got a we got 12 guys to play in this round robin 
King's Court style, uh, you know, group. It was so fun. Pickleball is so fun. I actually spent last week. Um, I took a. I took the week off of yoga last week because I wanted to do a little experiment where I instead of going to bed early and getting up early for yoga, I wanted to see most of the pickleball opportunities I get are later in the evening. So I spent a few days last week in the evening playing pickleball and I skipped out on yoga because I, you know, I, I, you know me and I like to, I've, I prioritize my sleep and I need fucking eight and a half hours of sleep to function. So I, uh, and yoga's at 5 a.m. I got to get up at 5 a.m. for yoga. So I, uh, I wanted to see if I would feel better or happier by doing that instead of going to yoga. I've been doing that Ashtanga class twice a week for the last, it's been a year now. End of July was a year. So, and I love it. I love the Ashtanga class. Uh, um, the problem is I really enjoyed playing pickleball, but my sleep routine is kind of, you know, instead of going to bed at nine and getting up at five, I've been going to bed at like 1030 and getting up at 630. And I don't care. I like, I'm happy to do that, but, um, I think I, I want to do all of it. This is what sucks is I want to play. I want to lift, play pickleball do yoga and now I'm I'm also doing that zone 2 training on my bike so it's it just I'm I'm stuck in a hard place with my exercise routine. It made sense while I was training for the Spartan to just focus on lifting and focus on yoga, but now that the races are done and I really don't care to do more to go hard in the races again. What I really want to do is be really good at pickleball. I want to get better at pickleball. And uh you know, it's just that's another thing to add to my routine. And so do I compromise? Do I give up something I'm already doing like yoga or the zone two training or do I give up lifting or do I do all of it and work out twice a day? So it sucks, man. I would just because after work, usually I don't want I want to play video games after work, which sucks because I love to play video games, too. I just don't care to be. Like the, the reason video games are so enticing is because they are in my house and all I have to do is sit on a ca- sit on my chair right here and click on a button and I'm playing video games. But to play pickleball, I either got to find a bunch of guys or I have to, uh, I got to rent out a little ball machine, a ball feeder. So it's just, it's tough to get, to make all of that work. Plus, and then I got a girlfriend that I want to spend time with and I have a job and family and whatever uh mashed potatoes not enough time in the day i end up sacrificing sleep for all the other stuff and it's dumb but it's not dumb because i know you we talked about this last week and honestly uh i think i'm i'm a little bitch because i i want to get tons of sleep and i hate how much time sleep takes eight and a half hours is a lot of fucking time and you stayed up later than I did last night, and you got up earlier than I did. I don't know how you feel, but I know I know you you've just always been able to operate off of fewer hours of sleep, like six hours. And I would love to operate off of six hours. To go to bed at eleven and get up at five, that would be like that would be prime time, and and to feel good too. You know, I I I prioritize sleep because of uh, all of the. Lots of the books that we've read talk about how important sleep is for longevity, for to be healthy as an old person and to feel good and to fight, you know, to, to strengthen your immune system and strengthen your autona- auto- autonomic, automatic, whatever, nervous system, you know, just, just to be sharper, to have better workouts, uh, to, to strength, you know, to sh- sharpen your brain be productive, not feel like crap. And I just feel like crap if I get less than eight hours of sleep. And I wish that wasn't the case. But definitely not enough time in the day. So I'm, I'm, I, I, this week I said I'm going to go to yoga and I'm not going to take the late night pickleball classes because I want to, you know, I'm going to see what makes me a happier person. The re- and I have reasons why I do both, right? I do yoga because I want to have 
strong joints and and uh, flexibility. As I get older, I want to keep I want to keep my body strong and healthy. Uh, hot yoga also helps with mental resilience. So I want to I want to be able to, you know I just want to challenge my body and my mind every day or a few times a week, just to be a just to be a wiser, healthier person. But I then I, the reason I want to do pickleball is because it's a sport and a hobby that that I'm really attracted to. It's really competitive and it's a lot of fun and it's exercise. I'm usually like zone two. My heart rate's in about zone two for pickleball, so it's good exercise. It's challenging, and I want to be really good. So, but long term, like, will pickleball make me a better person? I don't know, but working towards something that I like, that I enjoy, working on something that I enjoy, definitely makes me feel like it just makes me happier. Uh, mashed potatoes, I'm like 85% on six hours of sleep. So usually the sleep trade-off isn't a huge sacrifice, but it'd be nice to fit everything in and still sleep eight hours. Yeah, agreed. Do you, are, is uh, your little new baby at the point now where she's sleeping all night? Or are you and your wife still getting up all the time throughout the night taking care of, taking care of the baby? Because that's another hard part is I don't have any kids. You know, I'm just, I'm just out here complaining with no excuses. But you, uh, you, got, you, know, you, you got a lot of work to do and have kids. So. And you still get all your shit in. So I'm just, I'm just complaining and I'm going to complain because I'm still happy. I'm just trying to figure out how to make it all work. All right. So that's where I'm at. Our kids sleep from 8 PM to 7 AM. Yeah, that's awesome. Kids need a ton of sleep. Dude, that's like Kayla's sleep schedule when she's uh, working because she, you know, she works for 13 hours, 13 hour shifts and then has to sleep and she's so exhausted. I wish I could sleep for 11 hours a day. So uh, let's get into the book, huh? Life's good though. I know I don't have any complaints. I'm being, I'm just being a little poser, but the uh, part of, part of all of this too is just to be uh, like pickleball won't make me a lot of money, but this podcast doesn't make me a lot of money. I do it because it's because one, it it's, uh, it's contributes to my growth as a person, to my health, wealth, wisdom, and peace. And pickleball contributes to the like just things in life that you do that you enjoy that make you happy. You got to spend time doing. Uh, who was it that said you have to spend time every day doing something that you love? If you want to, if you want to be happy, spend time every day doing something you love. And that can be video games, it can be pickleball, it can be crochet, it can be croquet, whatever the fuck it is, karaoke, right? So do it, whatever it is that you enjoy, you got to do it. And I just love pickleball. So does it make me uh, healthier, wealthier, happier, peace, more peaceful, w- wiser person? No, not really. Healthier maybe, but and not peace. I don't like to include happiness in that for reasons I've explained. That happiness is a is a result of your biological needs being met, and not a uh, happiness is not like a result of something that you do. Well, I guess it's kind of the same thing, but hap- happiness isn't like the end the end goal. Peace is the end goal. Happiness is just a result of you know like having food in the in the pantry and and having electricity and having your bills paid but you could be at peace when those things aren't met so that's why you know that's why i like to i don't include happiness in the thing all right let's go let's let's fucking go how to think like a roman emperor by donald robertson the stoic philosophy of marcus aurelius this book was really really awesome so we read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, and now I want to read it again because I have a really, I have a better understanding of who he is and his philosophy. His Meditations is just his journal, basically, and this is like a breakdown of his philosophy, a breakdown of his of the Meditations. And what I love, you know, why I think why Marcus is so celebrated in the world of Stoicism is because he was. An emperor in the first and 
first century and uh, he was the Roman emperor. He was the most powerful person on the planet at the time. So his life was just documented. His life was documented, his events, the things that he did, the people around him. It was just all documented. And then he himself wrote in his journal a private meditation uh, all the time. So we have his record and then we have just the thing. We got to see history as it was recorded about how he behaved. And he was a very wise, a very humble person who didn't want power but was adopted into it, literally. Uh, learned a lot about his background. This book t- talks a lot about his background and then his philosophy. It also talks about Stoicism and in general, what it means to be a Stoic or to follow Stoic philosophy and some of the neighboring f- f- uh, philosophies. I think Epicurus is mentioned, or Epictetus, one of them, uh, as uh, as a separate branch of philosophy. And there's also cynicism or cynical, cynic philosophy, which is also is like another branch off of Stoic philosophy. Anyway, we lo- I loved this one. Let me tell you about Donald Robertson. He's Scottish. So the audio, his, I, I did like t- maybe 25% physically reading, 75% audiobook, for those of you who care. So you got to, and he narrated, so we got to listen to his rich and, uh, his rich Scottish accent. Donald Robertson is a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist, trainer, and writer. He was born in Ayrshire, Scotland, A-Y-R-S-H-I-R-E. Ayrshire, and after living in England and working in London for many years, he emigrated to Canada, where he now lives. Robertson has been researching Stoicism and applying it in his work for 20 years. He is one of the founding members of the nonprofit organization Modern Stoicism. So, the guy is also a psychotherapist. There's a picture of him for those in the live watching the video. He, uh, so not only is he just, you know, he, does he understand the Stoic philosophy, but what he does is integrates the Stoic philosophy and psychotherapy, the, uh, the, the logic behind, or the, the theory behind psychotherapies and how they, how they exist together. So he talks a, a, t- a ton about cognitive behavioral therapy and then just a bunch of terms that are used in psychotherapy and how the, you know, the Stoics basically figured out they weren't calling it the same things, but it was they were practicing the same things to experience peace, to relieve anxiety and depression and to live meaningful lives. So it was an awesome collaboration of the two. So let's talk about it for a second, huh? I got uh, my notes. Oh, yeah, let's see. Got some text I'm looking at really fast. Um, Yeah, give me half a second. To respond, it's my boy. Let me see. Sorry, this is important. This is just what happens when I'm trying to do a business and a podcast at the same time. This is urgent. Mm, Let's see. After the pod. Do what you got to do. Uh, okay, let's go. Let's see. Let's get to my notes. So, um, yeah, this book, very straightforward. Broken down into eight chapters. No parts. Eight chapters. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was... I got... You know, I I just broke down the he he explains the principles of philosophy and uh, of stoicism, and then he integrates history of what how Marcus did, like the events that occurred and how he handled them, and then how it applies to some of these major uh, parts of philosophy of the philosophy. I'd actually prefer to watch you do work instead of the pod. I know, I wouldn't. I want to do this pod, so. Sorry, 
If you want to watch me work, you could pay me. I don't work for free. Except I do the podcast for free, that's all. <laughs> okay, in the introduction, he says, uh, I took a note that says, Anxiety and depression are a result of when things we consider valuable and desirable are threatened. We are attached to these things. Anxiety and depression are a result of when things we consider valuable or desirable. Of when things we could, yeah, are threatened. Uh, a little, uh, you know, a thought that I have when I talk about anxiety and depression. I was talking to my grandparents about this book last night. About, we were talking about Viktor Frankl and being a, you know, being a concentrate a Nazi concentration camp prisoner. And his philosophy, as he explained, that he who has a why can bear almost any how, and li- uh, life is uh, uh, peace comes through accepting your circumstances and having a good attitude, basically. And me, I'm saying that from the comfort of my home, with no real, with no crazy life circumstances that are destroying me, right? Like nothing that no crippling problems you know so I, i'm extremely fortunate to be raised in this environment that i am to live in the place that i have to have the comforts that i have and while there are people out there who who are born into poverty uh born into slavery born uh people who are abducted and like all the just a really sad and hard and crazy crazy shit that happens in this fucked up world and i'm sitting here on a podcast saying Oh, if you want to relieve your anxiety and depression, you have to detach from the things you consider valuable. I mean, it's it's naive to just say that. So I don't want to just say it and without acknowledging that there's just so much there's so much shit out there in the world. And and I know people who who experience uh, really intense anxiety and intense depression. And it's not just it, it. I know it's not just a matter of. Change your perspective. And that's, I don't even think that's what he's saying. He's a psycho, psychotherapist. But the, the principle behind, you know, the principle is the same regardless of, of the depth of your struggle. We all struggle to some extent. And like I've, I think I've mentioned, Joe Rogan quotes somebody. I don't know who says it. But someone said, um, the worst thing that's ever happened to you is, is still the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Whether that's you lost your job or... Uh, you lost a child or you you broke your foot or you you were born into into um poverty there's a there's another word that comes before po- like uh uh ooh I'm forgetting the word but base you know what you know what I mean but the uh you know the worst thing that's ever happened to you is the worst thing that's ever happened to you so not just you can't just change your environment by changing your attitude in fact part of Frankel's philosophy that I that I love so much is um, as a Nazi concentration camp prisoner, he still encourages that uh, he, or he teaches one that you can get through almost anything if you have a purpose, if you have a why to it, why you want to get through it. And for him, the reason why he wanted to get out of the concentration camp, he had a couple. One, he wanted to see his family and his wife again. Uh, his parents and then I think um, that changed after he learned that his family died he lost if I remember the, the his story correctly he lost that why when he learned that his family had died and then the uh, lost the lost the desire to live to survive but then but then his why became I need to get out of here and I need to write I need to finish my my I think it was a dissertation on suffering and on uh, some uh, on psychotherapy, some something along those lines. He, uh, just to finish his education and and then teach and explain the what happened in the concentration camp. So his his why changed. But first, you can get through most situations if you have a why, and then two, you can experience peace through involuntary forms of suffering, like being a prisoner in a concentration camp, like being born into poverty, like your parents. D- uh, well, divorced or dying or or whatever you know you can you can find peace in your circ- situation regardless of the le- the the depth of the suffering 
And again, it's coming from a boy who's sitting in a in a in his house and it's really comfortable. So the point but the point is um yeah, we all we all suffer. Okay. So I'm going to I'm leaving that context out there. I'm going to keep talking about the book. I know that he's not saying just change your attitude and you can you can you know, be at peace. Like some people are some people are, are sick and their brains are wired differently and they require medical intervention to actually experience peace or calmness and relief from their struggle you can't you you can't you know change your brain chemistry just by thinking differently so i'll say it again anxiety and depression are a result of when things we consider valuable or desirable are threatened and the easiest example i can give is my fridge broke and we just went shopping to fill up, you know, to get food and we put it in our fridge and then 24 hours later it was warm in our fridge and we lost all of the food that we just bought. And I I am not attached to the food. I'm more attached to the money that I spent for the food. And I was I've I've been thinking about this since it happened. I've been upset that I lost the money that I spent on the food cuz now I got to go buy everything again and I got to buy a new fridge probably. Or at least pay someone to fix it, and uh, it it bothered me for the you know the weekend. I was uh, at least when it, we learned that it happened, I was I was just really irritated and I was not pleasant to be around. And my girlfriend's like, "You need to relax," and I totally do because I I'm not I just am unpleasant and I can be short, fused, and rude. Not you know just in general. Anyway, I was atta- I am attached to the money I spent for the food for the fridge that I had. Now I got to go out. So it bothers me, but it only bothers me because I'm attached to the thing. So, so anxiety and depression are relieved, uh, superficially at, you know, at the, at the least they're relieved when you detach from everything that's outside of your control. It's not, in, it was not within my control that the fridge broke. It broke and I can either be you know, I, I, and it kind of requires meditating on the fact before the event occurs that anything in my house can break. I, everything needs to be replaced at some point. And then on deeper levels, uh, you, you, you contemplate memento mori, which is your own death. You contemplate the death of your loved ones, the separation of yourself from your loved ones and loving them anyway, without, ex- without, um, expecting love in return or service in return, right? That's, that's detachment. You can love your family, um, but contemplating the separation of them with that because you can't control their decisions and you can't control if they die tragically. It's so morbid, but it's just the truth to the discussion. Uh, you can't control those things. And so when they happen, when the fridge breaks or if someone dies, you know, you, you, it, it's part of, going through that experience well requires you to have thought of, have been meditating on it before it happened and the more you meditate on it the more you, the more you accept that reality the better you handle it when that shit happens so that's uh you know that's this is, i'm still in the intro i'm still in the fucking intro to the book so this but this is the this is stoic philosophy and and it's also psychotherapy right it's it's both so i took a i took a big quote Oh, let's see. Read end of second to last and beginning of last chapter in the intro. I love the, you know, I love the philosophy. I love this philosophy. I stand this philosophy. Okay. So from the, from the introduction, I believe, quote, quote from Donald Robertson. I believe that for m- many people, a combination of stoic philosophy and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, may be even more suited for use as a long-term preventative approach. When we take it on as a philosophy of life with daily practice, we have the opportunity to learn greater emotional resilience, strength of character, and moral integrity. That's what this book is really about. The Stoics can teach you how to find a sense of purpose in your life, how to face adversity, how to conquer anger within yourself, moderate your desires, 
experience healthy sources of joy, endure pain and illness patiently and with dignity, exhibit courage in the face of your anxieties, cope with loss, and perhaps even confront your own mortality while remaining as unperturbed as Socrates. Who, if you remember, Socrates, is, he, was the, he was betrayed by, his, by the emperor, sentenced to death, and subjected willing, you know, without, without, uh, without objection without, and without remorse. And because, you know, because he, as a philosopher, he just taught death is natural. It's nothing to be afraid of or ashamed of. And I can go to my deep pe- death peacefully. And he did. So that's what this book is about. Integrating psychotherapy with stoic philosophy to overcome those, those hard things and really just to be at peace in your life. And, uh, he talks about it as a preventative approach, which means it takes, you have to subject yourself today to voluntary forms of suffering to become better at dealing with involuntary forms of suffering in the future. Okay. So as I've already explained, you have to, you have to do hard shit today to be uh, you have to choose to do hard shit today to be better at handling it in the future when you don't get the choice, right? Whether it's your fridge breaking or whether it's you get in a car wreck or a, your fucking house blows up, right? Whatever whatever it, it is that you have no control over. Shit happens. And are, how well are you going to be able to deal with it then? And it really determines how... You, you spend your time today, how you prepare yourself for those events. Ah, so let's talk about it. Eight chapters, 32 minutes in, let's get to it. <sighs> Chapter one, the or, uh, he, he talks about the origin of Stoicism. Um, the, cynic, the cynic philosophy holds that virtue is the true goal of life. Our character is the only thing that ultimately matters and that wisdom consists in learning to view everything else in life as utterly worthless by comparison. Um, uh, this is the cynic philosophy that uh, our character is the only thing that ultimately matters and that wisdom consists in learning to view everything else in life as utterly worthless by comparison. Stoicism branches off of this form of cynicism by arguing that health is preferred to sickness and that wealth is preferred to poverty and that strength is preferred to weakness. Um, These things are required to live a a good life as well or or help help to live a good life. They're not required to live a good life, but um, like neglecting wealth for the sake of philosophy, just like Buddha subjected himself to to starvation and suffering to experience it and he learned that uh going through suffering for suffering's sake is a waste of time you should avoid suffering when you can this is what victor frankl also taught if you if you can avoid suffering then do it being a you know masochistic is not wise choosing to choosing to suffer for suffering's sake like like and this is different than choosing to suffer for, uh, to to build resilience. So if you can avoid, like, like if you're in a toxic relationship, choosing to stay uh, because you think it's building resilience it, it is probably having more harmful effects than positive. Voluntary forms of suffering don't include like degrading the qual- your quality of life. When I talk about and I have talked about them before. Voluntary forms of suffering look like, um, let's see, voluntary. F- Sorry, I lost. I lost my train of thought. Voluntary forms of suffering look like going to the gym and doing meditation and doing hot yoga and doing cold showers and uh, you know uh, s- sacrificing immediate pleasures for, uh, like. For me, one of the things that I struggle with the most still is controlling my food portions, my the, the the my you know how much food I eat. 
because I can just I can eat a reasonable amount of food and be satiated, but I always want to gorge myself. And I want more. I want seconds and thirds of whatever the meal is, and I want dessert two or three times. You know, I <laughs> and then I always feel like shit after. But that's one thing I struggle with, and to engage in the craving is it's not inherently wrong. I mean, it's not healthy for my body, but to choose to stop eating, even when you're, you know, when I know I can eat another whole plate, choosing to stop because this is what my body needs is, is technically, it's kind of a form of suffering. It's It's a form of challenge, which makes you stronger, but being in a toxic relationship or being in a job that doesn't appreciate you, you're underappreciated, underpaid, whatever, disrespected, and staying because you think well, this is making me a better person is probably contributing to a. Uh, it's it's probably um, har- harming your quality of life. So avoid form avoid suffering when you can. Like avoid um, suffering when it doesn't contribute to your resilience or to make you a better person. That's that's what that's okay. So that's where that's kind of where stoicism comes from. Uh, yeah. We prefer health to uh, health to sickness, wealth to poverty, and strength to weakness. Zeno is basically the founder of Stoicism. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. That's a cool note, Cade. Uh, here are the uh, we've talked about the four cardinal virtues of Stoicism. I think Zeno. Uh, I think Zeno coined these. Zeno lived before Christ, I believe. I could look it up, but I'm not going to. The four cardinal virtues for Stoicism are wisdom, justice, courage, and moderation. And I think instead of moderation, he uses temperance, but uh, moderation is used as a substitute. He t- I took a few notes under wisdom that I really appreciate. Wisdom is understanding the difference between good, bad, and indifferent things. All things have value. Wisdom is to, is knowing which take precedence this is this goes this goes back into like value hierarchies understanding what should take priority like most things that you do in your life are important but if you don't understand which are more important or which make you a better person or contribute more to your well-being than others then when you're confronted with the two then you you won't know what to what to do so the and for me honestly as i kind of explain i'm stuck between two good things uh, pickleball and yoga. Which which would I? Which am I going to do? And I need to I need to understand which makes me a better person, a happier person. In fact, my girlfriend's so wise. When I was t- telling her about this, my my fucking pathetic struggle, she says, "What will make you a happier, per- a better person tomorrow? Uh, will going to pickleball tonight and missing yoga tomorrow make you a better person, or missing pickleball tonight and going to yoga tomorrow?" make you a better person. And that's I think that's so wise and I that's what I think about in my head. But that's that's a, your value hierarchy, which makes you a better person. So, spend time contemplating your values to understand which road you should go down when you're confronted with two good decisions. Uh mashed potatoes, am I running Am I ruining my intentional suffering if I watch a movie while I do my Zone 2 bike ride? Because when I watch a show, I actually look forward to it, and it doesn't feel like suffering. <laughs> but if I cut that out, that would feel more like intentional suffering. That's a really good question, dude. So um, I say, no, you should definitely, if watching a movie while you ride helps you ride, then don't stop watching the movie. Uh, I've mentioned before that, uh, okay, well, recently I have been doing all of my workouts with no music, no headphones. I go to the gym with no headphones. Yoga, I don't have a choice with no headphones. The bike, I've been reading. I've been with sitting down with my physical book and reading. Because zone two is not really, it's not as intense as everything, you know, as like pumping iron or, or running fast. So... And the, the, my reasoning behind it is the distraction that I use while I'm exercising it, or what I'm doing during my exercise distracts me from the suffering, right? So, yes, you, go, you, you get on the bike and you watch a movie and that makes the ride much more enjoyable. And I, 
I actually think that's awesome. And if you can, if you, if that will make you ride, like I would, I would say to anybody, do that. And and if not watching, like I'm not encouraging you to stop watching. The reason I'm not, the reason I choose not to do those things, is so that I experience the suffering. Uh, you know, like it, I think that by removing distractions, you are building your mental resilience. You're strengthening your resilience. So, uh, because because in a weird random situation, if I were uh, arrested and put into prison, I'm not gonna have my distractions. I don't have my music and I don't have my movies, right? So I I I'm sitting. I'm with my thoughts in an uncomfortable position or or situation. And I'm not saying that I'm gonna get arrested. I don't want to get arrested. But I'm what I'm saying is I think that by sitting on the bike for an hour or by lifting weights for an hour, or by running for an hour without music and without, you know, just like pleasant distractions, you're simultaneously strengthening your resilience. So I would not, I'm not encouraging people to do that because I, I, you know, I, if not watching a movie or, or taking your headphones out while you exercise means you're not going to exercise, then that's, it's, it's, you, then don't do that. You should always exercise especially if you're in a habit of it i'm just going above and beyond and being kind of obnoxious i but that's a really good question uh, whether you're being you know whether you're being uh serious or kind of joking um i think it's i think it's worth considering exercise anyway don't stop exercising because caden said to take your headphones out while you're exercising that's not what i'm saying at all keep exercising <sighs> So uh, let's keep going. Chapter two, Marcus taught, wherever it is possible to live, it is possible to live well. To live according to nature means how to live consistent, how to consistently rely on reason as our guide to life. Okay, there's two thoughts there. Wherever it is possible to live, it is possible to live well, whether that's in a good, whether you're the, the Roman emperor or you're a, a peasant, right? Wherever it is possible to live, it is possible to live well. Just like the monks that live up in the mountains with no running water or beds or electricity or phones or internet or what, and, and all of that stuff. They perhaps live a more peaceful life than all of us who are struggling to make sense of all of the distractions that we're faced with, with social media, with technology, with computers and video games. Uh, we probably live lower quality of lives than those monks because they spend their time contemplating the meaning and purpose of life. So it's not things that make you happy or it's not things that allow you to live well. Like my, I don't live a meaningful life because I have a running refrigerator. I live a meaningful life because of my ability to uh, accept my situation, whether it's awesome or sucky. So that's, that's, that's how I interpret that. And then to live according to nature, which is, it's basically like, that's like the number one commandment for Stoicism, I think. Live according to nature. And I have a couple, I have a couple thoughts about that, but the point to living to nature means how to consistently rely on reason as our guide to life. How to consistently rely on reason as our guide to life. So, um, it, it Emotions are important because emotions help us. Oh, I'm gonna get this fly. Hold on, this fly has been a bitch. Got it. That was well worth my time and worth interrupting my thought on the podcast. That fly has been bothering me for three days. Oh, okay, but now no more. So, uh, yeah, emotions are good. They help us. They help. There are. They are our. Re, uh, response to external events but controlling our emotions is reason understanding why we feel emotions to particular events and then making appropriate decisions based off of that ex off that reasoning is living according to nature and that's how we experience peace by not be living reactionary reactionary reactive not being reactive that's the word we aren't reactive to the uh, to the, the events that occur in our life. We contemplate them. We contemplate our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings. We we 
uh, and we we kind of we come up with reasons to them, and then we make appropriate decisions. That's living according to nature. That's the number one commandment. That's how we live. That's how we experience peace in this life. That's one way we experience peace. Quote: What matters is not how we feel, but how we respond to our feelings. Someone said, it's not things that upset us, it's how we think about things. Was that Socrates? It's not things that upset us, it's how we think about things. Right, this just goes along with the same idea. It's What matters is not how we feel, it's not what our emotions are, it's how we respond to our feelings, to our emotions. Value, value judgments cause anxiety. This is a uh, psychotherapeutic term value judgments um uh to under the definition of a value judgment is an assessment of something as good or bad in terms of one's standards or priorities um yeah how we judge situations how we view situations so if our value judgments cause anxiety when we when we when we deem things as good or bad in the world and then assign you know we assign things as good or bad and then that that causes anxiety one it means that Something is good, so this thing must happen, and if the bad thing happens, then it's going to be, you know, then it's not good. It's bad. And then we think about those things, and that causes anxiety. We, we, you know, being attached to that connection, to that, to that judgment, that causes anxiety. Instead of saying, why me, observe what is happening while being removed from it. This, this is unattachment, disattachment, whatever the, whatever the right word is. This is not being attached to the thing. And that's really, you know, again, regardless of the severity of your situation, whether it's, you know, whether it's you have a, whether you have crazy shit happening in your life or not, you're born in crazy situations or not, how you view the situation will ultimately determine the peace or anxiety that you feel. If you if you say I have to have a million dollars to have peace, and then you don't have a million dollars, you can't be at peace because you have a value judgment to what peace is, but uh, or to what you know to what to things that you need in your life. Um. And just be, because it's fair and accurate, what was uh, Maslow's or Ma- Ma- Maslow's hierarchy of needs? The first was I'm going to pull that back up because this goes. We have needs, and we have we need to have our needs met to have peace, or to you know, or to just to grow. And um, okay, here we go. So we have needs, and they're we can't ignore everything. We can't ignore everything, just like the cynics believe that our needs are subservient, subservient to our to wisdom, to the love of to the love of wisdom. We, we have things that will allow us to live meaningful, peaceful lives. So what we need, five, uh, five needs in order of importance. Base, the baseline, number one, physiological needs, air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing. Number two, safety needs. I'm reading this from simplypsychology.org. Safety needs. Personal security, employment, resources, health, property. Number three, love and belonging, friendship. Uh, what's that word? Intimacy, family, sense of connection. These, te- these words are really small. The fourth is esteem, respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, strength, freedom. And the fifth, desi- uh, self-actualization, desire to become the most that one can be. So you can't have any of those without you got to build on each other. You got to build first on physiological needs, then safety, love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization uh, first. And self-actualization really is once you have all of those other things, you can just explore the world and explore uh, how to make the most out of life and help other people and build up. This is self-actualization is the desire to be to become the most that one can be. So you have air, food, water, shelter, you have uh, personal security, a home, uh, resources, and then you have friendships and relationships and intimacy and family, connection, and then fourth is you respect yourself, you have a uh, high self-esteem, 
Do you have status in the world or among your peers, recognition, strength? And then you can go out and help other people. So, okay, so this, we can't live life without our needs being met. But the truth is, we don't need a whole lot more than that. We don't need a million dollars. We don't need a mansion. And we don't need a dozen cars to be happy. We need those things. Um, these are the five levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, let's keep going. Num uh, chapter three, if we want to learn wisdom, we must be able to listen to everyone we encounter and show gratitude to those who rebuke us. We must train ourselves to know good criticism from bad. This is done by listening to feedback rationally and sorting it. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting, uh, would it be a paradox? Not a paradox. It's uh well, there's a con I think there's a contradiction in 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 this and I, like I kind of explained um, as it's kind of explained in the note. To learn wisdom, we must be able to listen to all feedback that comes and separate it as it's not personal attacks on our character or on our identity. It's just feedback from the world. But not all feedback is valuable, right? If you are a musician, this is the first example. If you're a musician and you work hard on your music and you put a, some, if you write a song and you put it out in the world, you'll receive feedback. People will love it and just listen to it unconditionally because maybe you're John Mayer or Coldplay or Beyonce or whatever. People will just unconditionally love your music. And then there will be people that unconditionally hate your music, right? Uh, whether you're Coldplay or John Mayer or Beyonce, people will just hate your music. Those forms of feedback are not as valuable as I think as you know just in my head as what's in between the people who cons are, are consuming the music and then not attached to John Mayer or Coldplay or Beyonce they are listening to the music and, and you know they have a taste of music and they understand you know they understand a music at a, in a general sense where they can determine if this is quality or if this is shit and uh, the feedback that those people you will receive by putting music out in the world will range from, right, the unconditional love to the unconditional hate. And um, you have to be able to filter out the bullshit, the, meaning, the meaningless feedback to the meaningful feedback. Uh, meaning, really, uh, this, is just, this is just my take. Meaningless feedback is people who will unconditionally love your music or unconditionally hate your music. Uh, the useful feedback is those in the in between saying, I you know, I, li I really like this album. I didn't love this part of it, or maybe you could have done this differently, or I I would have liked this, or you could have turned this up, or included this instrument, or whatever. I it's just an example. So, wisdom is hearing all the feedback, but it's filtering out the good, sifting through the useful and the not useful, but then also being detached from the feedback and not. Being not getting butt hurt when you receive criticism, you, you, especially if it's useful, right? It's not a blow on your character. It's just a it's just feedback. Uh, so who said something about the the shitty first draft? If you want to create anything, you have to create it. You have to create it for the first time, and most of the time, that first creation is going to be shit. But you can't create anything without creating it for the first time, and Creating it for the first time requires meticulous deconstruction and then to, to adjust and fix and change or maybe just destroy completely and then to recreate and to, re -cha and to change and add on and build and, to, and then to refine it to something awesome. So um, when you write something, if you, like I write the blog and I do this podcast and whatever, and it's never perfect on the first go. The, my writing sucks on the first go. A lot of times I just post it anyway because I don't have I don't spend it all day revising and revising. I usually just send out what comes up, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's just dog shit. It's the biggest piece of dog shit. But you have to create it. You have to you have to go through the criticism to build to make something great, and then or just wisdom in general. You have to experience good things, experience bad things, 
and then hear the feedback. You have to you have to try something and then hear the feedback. Whatever. Understanding your values and living by them allows you to live a more fulfilled life. Awesome. Chapter four. Let me get some water. Okay. Chapter four. People continually confuse pleasure with happiness. Seeking pleasure isn't immoral inherently. Marcus says the goal of life goal of life is not pleasure, but action. Um yes, yeah, so this kind of goes along with the the uh, part of the cardinal virtues where wisdom is understanding good, bad, and indifferent things, and then uh organizing them in a hierarchy, right? Uh, life isn't, well, maybe that's not totally, maybe that's not totally up the same vein, but, um, why did I think about that then? Seeking pleasure isn't immoral inherently. The goal of life is pleasure, is not pleasure, but action. Uh, I guess simultaneously, the goal of life isn't to seek happiness, but to seek peace, right? So, uh, that's kind of that's how I'm interpreting it. That note, pleasure isn't. But again, ple- uh, so the cynics believe that everything, comp- everything else, everything besides wisdom is not worth pursuing. But Stoics say there's nothing inherently wrong with pleasure. Uh, in fact, again, Stoics prefer health to sickness and strength to weakness. But uh, the uh, under, knowing the difference between wisdom and uh, what's the opposite of wisdom? Naivete. <laughs> knowing when your your decision is good or bad is up to you. So, or or just it just requires c- careful consideration. So, for an example, he talks about Marcus's uh, in, in his meditation in his book. He he. he talks about how he's glad that he didn't act on sexual urges that he had to uh an example that he uses that i remember is to uh, that he didn't act on sexual desires that he had about his slave and his wife or something something like that and uh but the homie had like a dozen kids too. So he wasn't, perver- he wasn't, obje- uh, uh, he wasn't objected to sex. It was sex in the right context, right? That's the, that's the point behind this peace. And, uh, peace comes through knowing when something is appropriate and when is, or wisdom rather is when something is appropriate or not. Uh, having a partner and having sex with them is, a normal, healthy, and pleasurable experience. And at the uh, on, at the same time, having having, uh, what would the word be? Like, compulsive sex with strangers is pleasurable, but not as but not um on the same level. And uh, because we uh, you know I'm I'm really struggling to put this thought together, but having having a partner and having a relationship with a partner brings more peace for a person for the short term and the long term than does having random sex with strangers or being, there's another word that I'm trying to use to describe, uh, just, just like compulsive sex. I don't know. It's not compulsive though. There's another word. Anyway, um, peace, peace comes through like the pleasure is more appropriate than, (laughs) uh, than the compulsion for sex so anyway but the same thing happens with like i said with food earlier uh there's nothing wrong with eating food and and enjoying it and feeling the pleasure with eating but over indulging in food is unhealthy for the body and for the mind so knowing when to cut that off when to stop eating is is uh wise and knowing when to like and another thing i struggle with is i just play copious amounts of video games and so on whenever I have free time, like I said, it's it's harder to go 
get people together to play pickleball than it is to sit on my computer and play video games. So um, anyway, that's the that's the wisdom is knowing when one thing is better than the other. Like sex in, isn't inherently wrong, but sex in the right context is uh, is better. It's better. Sex is better with a partner that you respect. It brings more peace to the person than does compulsive sex. I can think of the word. There's another word I want to use to describe that that other situation, but I can't think of it. Okay, so yeah, so um, p- uh, pleasure isn't inherently immoral. The goal of life is not pleasure, but action. Okay, uh, and then he's uh, another note I took from this chapter. Are you more impressed? I love this this hypothetical. Are you more impressed with how much alcohol a person can consume or how little a person can consume? So he, uh, the reason that this stands out to me is because uh there are people people have different attitudes towards different situations and i can just you, you could probably think of real and also just like uh, uh, fictional examples of people who drink a shit ton of alcohol and observers either being impressed or disgusted by it and in our world some people are really impressed by this by having uh by engaging in just unhealthy or bad behavior like like a person's body count is something that's people like you oh how many people have you had sex with uh a dozen oh i've had sex with a dozen and a half or i've had sex with six people or i've had sex with 40 people like some people are impressed by something quote unquote immoral so uh, but the point of this question is, where do you fall? Are you impressed by by something like this or are you disgusted by something like this? It speaks to your values. Uh, and ultimately, will it will uh, take you down that path. So if you're impressed by someone who can drink a shit ton of alcohol, then you'll probably try you'll tr- probably follow suit. But if you're disgusted by it, then you won't follow. So you're gonna do the opposite. You'll remain sober or you're like, I'm contented drinking. Two beers now. I don't want to get shit faced ever again, ever again. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Imp- I'm not impressed by it. I don't think it's attractive, and uh, it's you know. I, I want. I love more than anything. I love being sober. I love the feeling of being sober, and I love getting plenty of sleep, and I love exercise. Like those things feel way better than staying up late, getting shit faced, uh, while. Though, like being in that moment while you're shit faced is it's fun for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. It takes a lot of alcohol to get there, and then the the come down always sucks. But the uh, that like the the peaks and valleys of doing drugs or getting alcohol or or getting drunk rather is not as pleasure as as pleasant as just consistently remaining sober. The highs are are different. When you're just sober, when you sleep and exercise and do what's good for your body, those that experience is different than just being high all the time or being drunk all the time. And I think it's I I love the way it makes me feel. I love the way um, I love what I believe it's doing for my body for the long term. I I feel like I'm preserving something that I cherish. Like I love my body. I want to be healthy and I want to be strong and I want to live as I want to make the most out of my life. And I, when I drink, I feel like I'm taking it away from that. So anyway, I, I think that's a, I think that's a intriguing hypothetical. Are you more impressed with how much alcohol a person can consume, or how little a person can consume? Chapter five. The Stoics say it is not pain that upsets us, but our judgments of them. He uses cold showers and hot yoga as ways to train ourselves to bear uncomfortable and hard circumstances and situations. I fucked my note up. Uh, Let's see. Uses uh, and as okay. Uses cold showers and hot yoga as ways to train ourselves to bear uncomfortable and hard circumstances and sensations. This is called psychological resilience. I've already talked about this earlier. But we do, uh, you know, pain inherently sucks. Discomfort sucks. Uh, 
but the only way to bear them well or to bear them better is to subject yourself to, to subject yourself to them in small doses, in controlled doses, and in healthy doses. Uh, to cope with pain like a stoic, view it objectively. Separate yourself from your pain. This is cognitive distancing. Okay, so this is I think this is like the first time I've integrated uh, 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 psychotherapy with stoicism. But these are two terms that I talk about all the time, but have actual words in science. Psychological resilience and cognitive distancing. The sensation is still uncomfortable, but the suffering is alleviated. And one thing that's fascinating to me too, even with cold showers, every single time I do a cold shower, sucks. It always sucks. the the cold The cold is always cold, and I and the uh, the desire to do it never increases. It doesn't get easier. What I'm what the 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 difference is. I become more resilient. I become stronger. Like lifting a hundred pounds over your head will never be easy. A hundred pounds is still a hundred pounds. It doesn't get easier. You get stronger. You get better. And again, the only way to to deal with hard situations that you can't control well is to subject yourself to this to similar events intentionally voluntarily mash potato says not to go back to a thought okay then before i read that i'm just gonna finish my thought which i've already explained but this is this is psych- psychological resilience uh, and cognitive distancing um when you when you're subjected you're, when you when you feel pain even physical pain if you break your leg uh he, who does he reference i think he references epictetus who um some if i remember the story right someone was twisting his leg or like you know folding his leg in a way it shouldn't be folded and he says if you keep folding my leg it's going to break it's going to break it's going to break and uh according to the story if i remember it right the guy keeps twisting it and it just breaks boom and then he says look look what you've done i told you if you kept going it was going to break and now it's broken and then he goes on to uh do discourses where he says it's not being uh being lame you know having broken body parts that diminishes your quality of life it's how you view it it's how you view that circumstance and i, I don't know i don't know even know if i'm recounting that story correctly but um uh, if you break your leg or if you break your arm or, you know, if you have a headache, how are you going to view that sensation? How, are, how do you interpret it? Are you upset with the world because you fell off your bike, and, your bike and broke your arm? Are you mad at God or, or are you just mad in general? Or do you, do you view it as an objective circumstance? This is a, 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 in an objective way. That it ha- this is an event that happened, and I had no control over it, and so and so now I must deal with this with patience and integrity and grace. And this is how to experience peace when you feel physical, painful sensations. I think that's the end of that thought. So, but the two terms again that I want to point out: psychological resilience, which is um, you build psychological resilience by subjecting yourself to hard or uncomfortable circumstances now, like cold showers or hot yoga. And then um, if you want to deal with pain like a, sto- like a stoic, separate yourself from the pain. View it objectively. This is cognitive distancing. The sensation is still uncomfortable, but the suffering is alleviated. Okay, Hayden says, not to go back to a thought, but I feel like the world appreciates excuses more than discipline. Like people will clown you for not drinking enough or at all, sleeping enough, etc. So your why has to be strong because for some reason people like to down on good habits. Yes. Like some of my relatives will clown healthy eating. Like they call salad rabbit food and stuff. That's what Horsley does too. I don't know. It's just so weird to me that it's not in the inverse that we like people making good decisions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dude, one thing that I'll I have said before t- I, I keep repeating myself. I hope I'm not so obnoxious, but one thing that will fascinate me probably into the end of time is if you get invited, like for me, something I I have been dealing with but I don't deal with as much anymore because I've moved on and everyone's moved on is uh yeah, I would get shit on for 
going to bed early and I'd get shit on for uh, not staying up late playing video games. That's one example. But the, the example I want to draw on is going out to clubs and to bars on the weekends. It was something that I did. I did it for a few years. I, you know, I was just learning about the environment. I, I I've never done it before. Right. And it's what my friends have done. Some of my friends have done. And it's a fun way to interact with people and to uh, meet new people, especially when you're single. It's fun to, you know, just to to be outgoing and uh, f- f- I want to say flamboyant, but I don't think that's the right word. Just to be outgoing and to be social and flirt flirtatious. And uh, so I did it for a few years and then I, s- I changed course and, th- and then I saw and I stopped drinking uh, so heavily and I wasn't even really that heavy of a drinker. I just, you know, stopped getting drunk and stopped going out to clubs. And here's the here's what fascinates me because it goes exactly with what you're saying. The reaction to people when people say, let's go out to the clubs and I say, hey, I don't want to go out to the club, but I'll meet you for dinner and then I'll go to go home. I get made fun of for wanting to do that or used to. Uh, but if I were to say, if I were to invite my friends, hey, let's go to let's go do a hike in the morning or let's uh, let's go do a workout in the morning, you know, early in the morning, 6 a.m. Let's go hey, come do hot yoga with me. The, I was trying to get everyone to do hot yoga with me at 6 a.m. And uh, everyone's like, hell no, that's a stupid idea. They're not they're not viewed as they're not like made fun of because they don't want to do something good for themselves. Just like you're saying. I made fun of because I don't want to do something bad for myself. And uh, so, yeah, it's the, it, there's a, it's the weird way the world works. Weird way the world works. We are, we, we've just placed more uh, like social, there's more social acceptance to going out, staying up late, uh, indulging in just a bunch of, just a, you know, a bunch of, sensations like getting drunk and being flirtatious and eating lots of food, compulsive buying, compulsive drinking, and then not praised or, or, or not, uh, like we're almost condescended, condescending to neglect that so that you get some sleep and get some exercise and meditate and do what's good for your body. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. You said it better than I did. Maybe people, Hayden says, maybe people feel bad when they're making decisions they know they should be making, so they try and drag you down to their level to feel good about themselves. Yeah, or just to, and to just and to justify it, to justify the um the shitty behavior. But I also think it's like you know I wasn't um I I think it's also kind of a lack of awareness of what's happening because even when I was going out. I didn't know that I would feel so much better by doing, you know, by doing X, Y, and Z instead. It took me doing the shitty things and feeling shitty and then doing better things for me to learn. Oh, I feel way better uh, not going out, staying up late, being in the club, loud music, bright lights, bunch of people sweaty and drunk and gross and rude. And I feel better staying away from that after learning by going through it, by doing it. And uh, uh, we talk a ton about awareness and it took, it just took me some time to be in those environments to learn, oh, I feel like shit doing this and then do, and I did something else and now I feel way better. I feel way better. People just think they aren't aware that when they're, they, they just, they're like, oh, it's the weekend and so this is what we do to have fun. Like this is what a good time is. They see people online doing it. Their friends or their family have uh, uh, do it. So yeah, this is just what it what you do to have a good time. And that's what uh, that's just where you know everyone goes wrong. That's where everything. That's you. It just it's like a lack of awareness. I don't think everybody is. You know they don't make. I don't think everybody thinks. Oh well, if you don't come out with me, and you don't get drunk with me, then you're you know, I'm not. I don't think everyone's trying to drag you down to make them themselves feel better. They just think, why are you so lame for like, this is fun, right? This is fun. And so why are you being lame? Like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you for not wanting to, to go out and get drunk or to just a party? 
I don't know. Food for thought. But, uh, yeah, that was and that was for a previous. But I, there's, I, th- I think there's a lot to be said about all of that, about behavior and environments and the the just like exercising and listening to music or watching a movie while you exercise, all of that going out is just a big distraction. It's a big distraction. If you feel like shit, and like y- you go out and you are with your with your, you're with your friends and you're with a bunch of strangers and you're drinking and there's TVs and there's music and bright lights and dancing. It's all just a big distraction, and uh, so you just do it because. Maybe you don't even you don't even hate your life. You just you're just distracted from, like making the most out of life. What are you accomplishing by going out? And, and that's not what that's not even what it's about. Honestly, and I've always felt this way. the The best times, the best going out nights I've ever had were ones where we go to restaurants and we uh, we're sitting at a booth and we just order a bunch of food and we're socializing and eating and drinking. Like I, it's the interaction that I love too. Now all I want to do is just do it at home. I don't want to go to, go out to a restaurant and do that every weekend. I love having people over, like we had people over last week, and we had a barbecue and played cornhole, and it was like that's and that's meaningful engagement too. And I enjoy that way more than the shallow interactions you have with strangers. Like that's those are fun and memorable. Like it's fun to reminisce on crazy things that happen with strangers, but it's not meaningful. It's just it's just lighthearted and fun in the moment, and it's things that you. But then you you know there's also FOMO too, where people are talking about going out and oh dude you were so drunk and you and so and so were doing this crazy thing, and then you know, then you're like oh wow, but it's not the thing that I feel FOMO about. It's the it's the lack of engagement with my the people I care about, like the missing out on that experience with the people I care about. Uh, anyway, I'll move on. That's a good that's a good comment. Chapter 6. Uh this is about the inner citadel. And we talk I can't remember who uh what other book we've talked about this before but the inner citadel um is true inner peace comes from the nature of our thoughts rather than pleasant natural surroundings. So to be at peace wherever you're at requ- uh, requires uh a clear understanding of your inner citadel. True inner peace comes from the nature of our thoughts rather than pleasant natural surroundings. Now I'm thinking about being in the club again uh, where it's fun and lighthearted, big distractions. Those are, that's a, those are pleasant natural surroundings. But does it bring you peace, right? <laughs> Um, true peace comes from the nature of your thoughts. And honestly, just by doing this podcast, I'm, I'm working on the nature of my thoughts. I, I'm thinking about it, but being in the club or going out or just, or getting drunk at all or doing drugs, it just prevents you from doing that. It prevents you from spending time with yourself and, uh, contemplating the nature of your thoughts. So, Every time you decide to exercise and to meditate and <clears throat> to uh, do hot yoga, to ride a bike, whatever. Whenever you're sober and doing something meaningful, you're, spe- you're spending time with yourself, contemplating your values, contemplating the nature of your thoughts. And then you, and then you learn, oh, yeah, I actually really en- like I don't enjoy getting drunk and the bright lights. What I really enjoy is hanging out with my friends and um, playing game. Like I, playing games. That's me. I love playing games with my friends. Pickleball, cornhole, whatever. The the family vacation I went on to Island Park a couple weeks ago is uh, it was one of the best vacations. And I didn't get shit faced. We all we did was golfed. Kind of, I golfed one time, but. We played tons of board games and card games with all my family, tons of surfing, and uh, yeah, that was that was it. That was our whole trip, and but it was all meaningful engagement, not getting drunk and like falling over each other and 
doing that laughing stuff, right? Uh, that's fun, but it's not, I don't know, it's just not meaningful. I don't know. Do you have to be sober to enjoy the company of yourself and meaningful? Um... No, no, but I, it's just, uh, no, I don't think you have to be sober to have meaningful experiences. No, that's just me. Honestly, I don't like the way, I don't like the way I feel like, uh, I don't know what you heard earlier, Steez, but the, uh, like the, the highs and there's more highs and lows for me when I drink like the hot you when you get drunk there's like you know 30 minutes of that's just being really dizzy and really goofy feeling really goofy that feels really funny and you're doing it with other people and it's funny but it takes a lot of alcohol to get there and then you know the 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 come down on the other side it just always sucks so well for me I don't, I hate the being hung over and I and I hate I just you destroy the next day by staying up late um, by being sick, feeling sick, I just feel better having a, cu- like if the high from being drunk is like, you know, like a hundred points, but the lows are, you know, 20 points. Um, I would, I would rather be sober and just, you know, stay up, stay up kind of late and then get up early and, and do my exercise and play video games and, like if that's only like an 80 and getting drunk and that little mo- I would rather have the average a lower average than the really the peak and the valleys of of like partying. I just don't enjoy it, man. I just I just enjoy the sober interactions way more than I enjoy the drunk interactions. I it I, yeah, I just like ah, that's just me. I'm spending too much time talking about this. Uh, so I'm going to keep going. So yeah, inner, inner peace, true inner peace comes from the nature of your thoughts, according to Marcus, rather than pleasant, natural surroundings. <sighs> okay. Chapter seven, how to deal with anger. There are 10 maxims by Apollo page two thirty two that I want to share. So anger again is another, it's a reaction to an event in the world that uh, you you don't have control over, things happen to you, make you angry, make you feel angry. So how do you deal with that anger? How do you cope with anger like a stoic? This is what they do. Ten maxims by Apollo. We are naturally social animals. Number one, we are naturally naturally social, designed to help one another. Is number one. Number two, consider a person's character as a whole. Before you act on, you know, don't consider a person's character as a whole. Number three, nobody does wrong willingly, which is an interesting concept in Stoicism. Stoicism. Um, yeah, I'll just keep going. Chapter, uh, step four, piece number four, nobody is perfect, yourself included. Number five, you can never be certain of other people's motives. Number six, remember... We all will die. Number seven, it's our own judgment that upsets us. Just, you know, like all of the other wisdom from the past. It's our judgment that upsets us. Number eight, anger does more, does us more harm than good. Number nine, nature gave us the virtues to deal with anger. The main, uh, from number nine, the main antidote to anger for Marcus is the stoic virtue of kindness, which along with fairness makes up the cardinal social virtue of justice. Whereas the stoic viewed anger as the desire to harm others, kindness is essentially the opposite. Goodwill toward other people and the desire to help them. There are tons of his, tons of stories of Marcus forgiving people for betraying him. There's, you know, really in-depth story of one of his, I think it was his son-in-law who was a army, who was like one of his leaders in the army who declared that Marcus had died in Egypt. And so they named this, I think his name was uh, Cass, uh, Cassius Commodus. Anyway, 
But Marcus forgave him and his whole family <laughs> for betraying him. And number 10, it's madness to expect others to be perfect. That's how Stoics deal with anger. That's chapter 7. The last chapter, chapter 8, is a beautiful chapter. It is, uh, the title of it is Death and the View from Above. And it is, um, it's an allegory of, is that the right word? Allegory. What's the difference between allegory and an anecdote? It's a parable. Yeah, a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. Yeah, so, um, so it's a beautiful allegory of Marcus. Uh, he writes it as if he's Marcus, um, and he's lying in his deathbed. Marcus died from the, from the plague of the time. What was it called? Something with an A. And he was he was uh, in the battle. Uh, he was he was at the Romans were at war, and he was at the battle site with the soldiers. And he caught the plague. He was laying in bed. He's sick, almost sixty, dying, not doing well. That's and then this chapter eight is about him and how Stoics view and approach and embrace death. So it's this whole. Uh, story of him talking as Marcus in the first person saying, uh, well, I took some quotes. So th this is not what uh, Marcus said. This is just the allegory. Quote, fear of death is more harm to us than death itself because fear of death turns us into cowards. And remember, the opposite of cowardice is a a cardinal virtue, courage. So fear of death turns us into cowards. Um, and another quote I took, when we cut our ties to the past and the future and center ourselves in the present moment, we set our soul free from external things, leaving it to invest itself in holy and fulfilling its own nature. I fucked up the quote, dude. I do the, I do the, you know, speech, I like talk, I click the microphone and talk, and it never gets it right. When we cut our ties in the past and the future and center ourselves in the present, we set our soul free from external things, leaving it to invest itself wholly in fulfilling its own nature. I don't even know if that last, I don't think that last phrase is right, but... um. We've talked about living uh, anxiety is caused by being attached to, to something and it can be uh, it can resemble being attached to our past and being anxious to how we expect the future to go and relieving ourselves of those attachments will bring us peace and uh, death is. There's actually a beautiful quote from from Marcus from his book in the last chapter that's he's quoted. Maybe I'll just read this. Ah, eh, maybe not. Uh, Marcus says, "And if the elements themselves suffer nothing by this, their perpetual conversion of one another, one into another, that dissolution and alteration, which is so common to them all, why should it be feared by man? Is this not according to nature, death?" But nothing that is according to nature can be evil. So don't anticipate death uh, as an evil, as an evil thing. Death is more natural, arguably, than any other event, is or is as natural as any other event that occurs in life. Uh, death is completely unavoidable, and just as we just as we uh, were born. Just as we didn't, ex even even more so, just as we didn't exist before we were born, uh, we will not exist after we after we die. There's nothing, and we if we don't remember the the thousands of millions of years before our birth, perhaps the the millions of years that come after our death will be just as will move just as quick as anything else. Death shouldn't be feared; it should be embraced. And the philosophy to this is 
Memento Mori. It's the uh, GG's Hato. I'm just I'm wrapping up too. It's been 90 minutes. Perfect though. Uh, yeah, Memento Mori. Contemplating your death. Spending time with yourself. Observing life as it is, and then con- and then imagining your own death. Imagining the death of your loved ones. They'll they will inevitably come. This is this allows for a man to die. Uh, what the right word? I don't know. To die well. You have to. Yeah, but you have to think about it. This is it, you have to. You have to uh, consider it. If you live your life in fear of death, you will live as a coward, and to and to live as a coward is the opposite of the Stoics' cardinal virtue, courage. All right, that's it. And then in the audiobook, he went through the introduction again at the end. I don't know why, but this book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius by Donald Robertson, one of my favorites. It was awesome. An excellent breakdown of Stoic philosophy and also of the, uh, the life that Marcus Aurelius lived, how he... Uh, how he practiced stoicism how it exempt was exemplified in his reign as a roman emperor he was um uh, yeah he was I, and i think if i you know he was considered the last of the peaceful emperors before the collapse of the roman empire his you know they talk a little bit about his son taking over as emperor after marcus dies and then the kingdom collapses, breaks into civil war. Not not immediately, but just over time. Uh, yeah, awesome book. Next week on Book Club with Kate and Kelly, we will be discussing I Didn't Do the Thing Today, Letting Go of Pro- Productivity Guilt by Madeline Dorr. Uh, I think this is supposed to go along the same lines of that book by Celeste Headley, Do Nothing. Um, I've, I heard about this book on a podcast that I've been enjoying called uh, The Art of Manliness. So you know, he's doing the same thing. He reads these books, but then he has the authors on because he's, you know, he's popular and could do that. And maybe I could if I tried, but I don't. So I just talk about him and read the book. Say it's D's, GG's. Um, so that's what, that'll be next week. In the meantime, if you want to go back and catch up on any conversations and you want to do it in less than 90 minutes, go check out my shorter podcast, Here's the Point, with Kate and Kelly, where I do this in 15 minutes. And uh, you can find links to that on my blog, kadenkellysblog.wordpress.com. Com, or you can just search Here's the Point with Caden Kelly on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. So this week, uh, be like Marcus Aurelius and be like a Stoic. Consider your values and uh, learn how to detach from the things that you identify with, in uh, whether it's your job or it's your relationships or it's your hobbies or it's your fucking refrigerator. Learn how to detach from everything that you have no control over because... Doing so will allow for the truest sense of peace. Uh, that's it. Thanks for showing up, YouTube boys. Uh, appreciate you. And then we'll be here next week. Next is we'll be in September. Damn, that's crazy. Oh, next week is Labor Day. We should be fine though. I might be here. I might not. If I'm not here the, on Monday, I'll be here on Tuesday the sixth. So check out. Uh, you know, just. So, uh, you got to follow me on those on the on the sites where I do it live so you can get the notification that I'm live. Other than that, we will see you next week.
たい人、勝手読み直しきている、勝手読み直しきている、だけが手読み直しきている、勝手読み直しきている。Thank、you